Hello, 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 and welcome to the Loudcast with me, your host, Kevin McLean. I am still here, still in my flat and leaf, still bringing you some of the very best of spoken word. And we have an excellent show for you today, guys. We have poems from myself, from Carly Brown, from Hannah Lavery, and we are joined by the incredible Len Penny, who is going to be here to talk about all of her work, being online, going viral, all of that stuff. Uh, it's going to be an excellent show. If you have been watching, if you've been tuning in, please do remember to give us a little like, hit subscribe, all of that good stuff. It helps us get the video out to more people and it would be just lovely to have more people along for spoken word stuff. Speaking of spoken word stuff, we were back an actual person in an actual theatre with an actual audience. We've been doing some fringe shows. It's been going really well. There are still a few left in the run. So if you have not come along to the fringe show, do come and check it out if you're able to do so. It's been wonderful being back on the stage with some incredible poets. You guys know you've watched us for ages. Come and see it live. It'll be lovely. But for now, we move on to not live poetry, to recorded poetry that was once live, this is Carly Brown with 140 characters. What's on your mind? Says the white box waiting for me to update status. I'm learning to consolidate, to turn my thoughts into bite-sized chunks, chop them up into sugary hunks, tasty news flashes, entertaining summaries that I can shove into the impatient white rectangle of Facebook update status. Yes, send it out, perfectly palatable, digestible trinkets, my white chocolate anecdotes, these notes I've carefully wrapped up for you like a tiny Christmas morning special delivery. And I am so blissfully happy when it's liked. Yes. But then I see that phrase again, what's on your mind? And the white box popping up at parties in the air, the blinking cursor staring at me anytime that somebody says, hey, how are you? And I'm a little bit tipsy, so I'm tempted to tell the truth. Actually, you know, right now, I'm thinking that my hair is starting to look like a yield sign and how I'll never be able to finish my paper on time and how I can't remember if spirits go before wine and how you have a face like an old border collie of mine named Murphy who died a few years ago. And I can see that you don't want to know any more about me, but I'm going to keep going. I'm also thinking about how I won't be able to stomach a world of Kindles and eBooks and tweets and how I hate the way most people are, look when they are sleeping and how, and how I might be in love. That would be one way to defriend myself from everybody because nobody really wants to know what's on my mind. I will try to keep it succinct, instantaneous, and entertaining. I don't blame you. I'm training myself to join this cult of immediacy where we celebrate freeze-dried fast food and emoticons. Nothing is wrong with prepackaging my thoughts into the most recognizable, summarizable, friendly PR marketing packages that I can possibly conceive of so that you will like me. But if I were to give you more than 140 characters in that little box, if my words were to knock at the edges spilling over the top, would you stop listening? If I were to one day quit hacking up all that I want to say so that I can pack it away into that waiting white box, I feel like I'm standing in the middle of a gladiator ring filled with the corpses of things that I, I should have just said and looking ahead at a waiting public whose eyes blink like cursors in a status box as I type, are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Post. Thank you. Carly Brown there with 140 characters. Carly is one of the very best. We've had her in for the Fringe show that we're currently doing. She was on the second night, I think it was. We had her in for a whole bunch of stuff. She did an episode of The Loudcast. She's OGLP, so we get Carly in whenever we can. Do go and check out all of her work. But for now, we are going to move on to one of my poems. That's right, we're going to have to suffer through it. But it's all right because it has been made more spectacular and more beautiful by the wonderful Mark Gallagher who put a, a wonderful video together for it. Mark has been working tirelessly editing away and putting together all these sort of custom videos for some of the main LP poems. So please do go and give those videos some love. Give them a like. Give Gally a shout out in the comments if you can. I know he'll appreciate it. This is Kevin McLean with Soil. Imagine how slow the clock ticks, 
how annoying the flicking on and off of the sky is. The bliss of rain falling on a face large enough for a moon to orbit. The soil we stand on takes everything we throw away and absorbs it. Takes decay and strips away all the useful, returning something living, fragrant and beautiful. A flower. A symbol given the power to inspire a generation to play hard in the mud. To understand its worth and to see the damage we've done. A skin, large enough to hold every creature that walks the earth, but not so thick it doesn't feel every cut. Trampled slice and burnt, it shudders beneath the weight of what it's learned. That millions of years of crops, air and gold is not how respect is earned. That we will walk blindly over the gaps, we will stand by as habitats collapse, and that we have forgotten how to hold back. Everything we have built was born from the soil. A collected history of struggle, innovation and toil that will be swallowed tomorrow unless we remember that all we have is born. And like everything that's come before, it will return to the dirt. And that was me with a poem, and I don't know what to say about my own work. So let's move on. Uh, we're going on now to our next video, which is the wonderful Hannah Lavery, someone who I have no problem talking about. I will be waxing lyrical about all of her brilliance after this when we bring in Len Penny. She'll be kind of chatting about it. We sent this poem to her in advance. It's not even one single poem, actually, guys. It's an excerpt from The Drift, which is nice. I think it's a couple pieces strung together in that way that Hannah Lavery does oh so well. I know you're going to love it. Check it out. This is... Hannah Lavery. St Andrew's Day, 2014, and I'm reading my poetry at an event for Book Week Scotland. My dad had said in a Facebook comment that he'd try and make it. I'll be there. He hadn't made it. And I was, uh, what, no bothered? Aye, no fucking bothered. I had this poem, it was about him, it wasn't flattering. He's always been that monster in my rear view. Anyway, I finished my set, it went well. And uh, my husband is right there. Oh, fuck, you've got to pick me up. But it was the way he looked at me. Or maybe it was the way the air just grew heavier. You know when it's bad news. 3 p.m., I take to the stage. 3 p.m., he collapses on the floor in Leeds. 3.05, I start my poem. 3.05, an ambulance is called. 3.07, cheers, thanks for listening. 3.07, he dies. 4 o'clock, Hannah. Listen, I'm so sorry, but it's your dad. And it's the rage kissing the back of my neck. And it's that howl of all the things left unsaid. All the things you'll never hear. And oh, dad, unpack with me what made me this spit in the eye question mark. Made me this Brown girl in the ring, you were mine to carry. With that burden you swaddled me in, that burden you handed to me with my rattle, that burden of all that, who, why, what, you, you don't quite fit. A burden of their gaze that we shared, but my skin was lighter. A limbo under the colour bar for me, an almost slip into nationhood for me. No, Dad, you couldn't really. You're kidding yourself in your Scotland top, comic grotesque, walking your father's long white line of working men, hurtles and Edinburgh closes, and no matter how close they held you, how prized, how loved a son, this mother country made you fucking exotic. And whilst you fought that futile fight for something more, all that early brilliance, that fine rage, that packed punch, a waste. 
The only damage you managed to inflict was inflicted on your wives and your children, on me, on you too. You see, we inherit our family's trauma, their degradation, it drip drops its way to us, their stories weave their way to us in a Nancy's web in helix and knots. These ghosts we carry, broken bones on our backs. But I will find you, Dad. I will unravel you for me. I will see you whole. Turn your sea glass in my hands. Not just my daddy monster. And you know that's a neat fit. But you, you wear it badly. And we, you and I, I know. I get it. I get it. I know the real fucking monsters in our story. And that was Hannah Lavery with an excerpt from her incredible show, The Drift. If you have not seen The Drift, please do seek it out wherever you can. Hannah is an incredible writer and performer and a really important voice in the scene. She raises some really powerful, important issues and tackles them with uh, skill and poise. She's yeah, an incredible talent. Go and check her out. But we have another incredible talent with us here on the Loudcast today. I am very excited to chat to her about... Hannah Lavery's poem but also all of her own work it's going to be yeah a really fun chat I know you guys will enjoy it because our guest today is Len Penny Len how's it going I'm all right how are you doing I'm good I'm good thank you so very much for coming on to the loudcast I appreciate it thank you for having me (laughs) no worries uh, it's it's interesting because I normally uh, kind of commiserate with our guests at the start of this of being like, how's your lockdown been? Because <laughs> uh, a lot of poets, you know, are suddenly trapped inside, not able to get on stage. But you have been incredibly busy during this whole period of time. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to get into all of that in a little bit. I'm very excited to talk to you about what you've been up to in the last year or so. But before we dive into that, what did you think of uh, Hannah's poem? Or the I, excerpt. I was. It made me very emotional, which I didn't expect. I, I mean, it, I didn't know what to expect going into it because I just watched it completely, you know, blind. I went into it without knowing much context, and it started off. And I thought, okay, here's a poem about poems. It's you know, it's a, a <laughs> theme that's quite prevalent, and it's one I've explored quite a lot myself. But the more it went on, the more emotional I was getting, and at the end I was just like oh god I didn't expect to feel so many things from this because it's it's not a it's not a style of of poetry that I personally have worked with all my stuff is very quite rigid in its structure and its rhyme schemes and stuff so the sort of more free liberal sort of free verse style was just I didn't expect to like it as much as I did and I absolutely loved it I'm so glad to hear uh it's it's interesting because uh Hannah is is someone who like she's kind of the epitome for free form for me because she uses a lot of like structural stuff but she uses it where she wants and kind of very loosely and that's what I see like we, we've just here at uh, I Am Loud we've done a big uh, kind of year revolving around form we've had a couple projects where it's like challenging spoken word artists to write in form and for me I always wrote free verse and it's been like really interesting to actually learn the tools and then decide to break away mm-hmm. from them rather than the other way around uh whereas uh, seeing that kind of work is it is it tempting for you to kind of dive into and try some free verse if you if you attempted to write that way i've never actually tried to write anything that didn't rhyme i for a long time was very strict about the fact it has to rhyme if it's a poem it has to rhyme otherwise it's prose and then you know the more i explored poetry and, and deviated from the sort of very rigid burnsian style of everything has to rhyme at the end and a very simple rhyme scheme that wayne's can do the more i realized that not only does it not have to rhyme but you know it's sometimes it's better if it doesn't but um, for me, I've never, I've never tried to to do anything like that. Maybe I will, but I, I it gives me the fear. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because even with my lack of like form, I'm rhyme is what works for me as well. Like literally, mm-hmm. we have a, a kind of on the the channel the happy hour, which is like the four sort of main poets in the team. We get together every two weeks and sort of set a new challenge for the two weeks going forward uh, and I deliberately in this most recent one was like I'm not going to rhyme I'm not going to rhyme and the sort of first six lines I achieve it and then the rest of the poem just falls back into it it's hard to break with 
Absolutely. I mean, everyone's got their sort of their voice and the way that they think that they sound and rhyme and structure can be a big part of that, especially for me. You know, like Emily Di- Emily Dickinson, uh, someone on, on I think it was Reddit said that you can fit all of Emily Dickinson's poems into the Pokemon theme tune. <laughs> Because she always used a similar sort of meter and rhythm and rhyme, which yeah. I think is, first of all, class, and I want to do that and see that. <laughs> but say, it's like I feel the same way, and I, I find myself getting in a bit of a rut sometimes because I, I do the same rhythm, and it's like a piece of music, but you're always writing for the same tempo and cadence, and I, I want to I wanna break free from that, but at the same time, it feels comfortable. It, it, yeah, it's what work, works for you, right? And it's like there's there's that balance between trying to push yourself to do other stuff and being like, oh, but I like this. I want to yeah, do this. If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think Hannah's an interesting uh, example of someone who kind of finds consistency even when they push past those points. Because like Hannah has a very deliberate and and kind of it's that sort of very quiet authority on stage you know i mean she's not overly animated but what that does is it makes every movement she makes every gesture every like change in the cadence matter a huge amount and i think the Mm -hmm. opening of that piece where you know the sort of hand coming up to and and like the pairing of okay 3 a.m you know 3 p.m i take to the stage 3 p.m you know like that matching makes it all feel so huge even though it's these little pushies and so I, I find that pairing of performance and and writing style really really effective the first time i watched it i was focusing on the words and what she was saying and the second time i watched it i deliberately focused on how she was saying it because it's like i mean for me performance and poetry you can't have one without the other i mean you can read it but it doesn't it doesn't have that the same nuance and energy so when i was watching her perform the second time, I just wanted to see how she was evoking it because uh, for, for when I perform it, it, sometimes it's quite big, it's quite exaggerated, it's quite, you know, I want I want the audience to feel what I'm feeling and I want to make sure of that fact. But the way that she did it achieved the same effect, but it was so subtle that it forced you to focus and as you were focusing, it drew you in and then I watched it again and again and again because I just couldn't put my finger on why it was so compelling. Because, yeah, the words were absolutely beautiful and emotional, but the way she was performing it was also just so... There was such a... Like, a vulnerability, but, like, a confidence to it. Yeah, yeah. It was, as you say, so quietly powerful. I, I have a, a similar, you know, kind of vibe about things. Like, I, I've i never been affected by reading a poem the same way I have hearing a poem. And I think there's an instinct in performance poetry to lean into the big, right? The big emotion mm-hmm. to be like, I am going to show you how sad or how happy or whatever. Whereas like, I, I, I think it's telling that Hannah spends a lot of time in the theatre world. She's a playwright and director mm-hmm. and she understands, you know, when less is more, I, I guess. And I think that's yeah. quite a, like a, a refined performance technique to know like how to do little and still evoke a great deal of emotion. It's like very impressive. It was the the nuance is something that you it feels very much like she's she, she's so comfortable in her own performance style that she doesn't have to rely on the big to get a reaction or a response 100 percent. she can just take her foot off the gas a wee bit and just feel authenticity from herself and have that resonate with people it's it, as well I think because you can you can see uh, you know it's that's an excerpt you know Hannah did a full set with us that night and it still wasn't the full show mm-hmm. um, but like there's a through line like it's almost hard to edit Hannah when you're doing the videos because she doesn't like construct the set there's it, you know she wasn't doing like gabbing in between it was almost like one seamless poem she took her poems and wove them together to make something coherent in you know but separate from the show she's like such a, a dynamic performer in that way where she really puts like you can feel the pra- the effort from someone like hannah you know she's not just wandered up there and like giving it a go she's like nailed what she's doing which i i love to see like a like a kind of symphony with different movements but there's a common sort of motif through it all that is a, a much much better way to put it than i did <laughs> 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 Another reason I wanted to bring up uh, Hannah with you is because uh, Hannah is someone who, in her work, speaks a lot about like Scottish identity, mm-hmm. and like a lot of her work is obviously through the the lens of growing up as a, a black person in Scotland and like her family history and like how that uh, you know affects her having like 
you know parents from from sort of different ethnic backgrounds and things like that and mm-hmm. um, but you are someone who speaks a lot about like scottish identity in general and that sort of subject of like how people shouldn't conflate scottishness with whiteness uh, and like is, so is scottish identity you know be beyond obviously we're going to talk about scottish language and stuff scots language but like is scottish identity something you're really wanting to represent in your work i think that my perceptions on identity have definitely changed as i've explored the theme through my work because at the start you know i didn't feel particularly connected to scottish culture and scottish identity but as I've explored what that actually means, I feel like Scottish heritage and Scottish identity are something that we should be proud of. But at the same time, my perceptions on what it means to be Scottish have also changed because through looking at other people's work, through looking at people who have different experiences of identity and different experiences of the self as it relates to Scotland, I've I've come to associate myself with a different kind of Scottish identity to, I think, what people perceive it to be. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 interesting how I get a lot of criticism and hate in relation to Scottish identity, how it's not made me overly defensive of it because I now no longer feel like I have to defend that aspect of my personality. That's that's a really positive way to look at it, I think, especially in the face of like that overt criticism. Like, obviously, you have a, you know a large profile online, and so like <laughs> that automatically is going to generate a certain level of antagonism. And then you have the audacity to also be a woman <gasps> and young and have a Scottish accent. So, like, oh, the you audacity. know, what I mean? <laughs> it's just gonna it's just gonna provoke people. It's the what other choice do they possibly have? And um, so I think that's a really positive way to like react to it to then not try and like either defend it or like cow to that pressure but just be like well I'm going to continue to do my thing because that's who I am that's my identity right well I mean I've had a lot of therapy so that's not <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't claim credit for that that's that's a mindset that's been achieved through rigorous work on the self but uh but I it's it's been I don't want to I don't want to say that it's been a wholly negative experience but I'm also not going to deny the fact that god it's it's been a bit rough. <laughs> it's it's I've spoken to a few sort of artists who you know have had that kind of and almost all women to point out as well. Oh, um, that's the, that's not expected at all. <laughs> yeah, right. And they have have had that process of, of like real backlash. Like Hannah is one of them who you know got got stick for for some of her work, and it's often rooted in people not understanding the work or even really engaging with it like one of my uh one of the things katie raised uh who's the researcher for this show mm-hmm. was uh obviously you you have a poem uh i'm no having children yeah um and the the premise of that poem is that you're having wanes right and that's that's like it's it, it's not about what you would initially think from the yeah. title and you got a lot of comments of people being like ah oh, you'll change your mind hen and you're like uh. They the, haven't wor- even the worst bothered thing to listen. was the worst thing was the people who said if if more of people like me in quotations didn't have children that the white race would die out and i was like not only is that a fundamental misunderstanding of the concept of the poem that's also a fundamental misunderstanding of how life works <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's like a, a double you know dose of ignorance it was phenomenal that was a that was a strange one to get because it's it's interesting. I mean, there's no wrong way to interpret a poem. I say very, very loosely because it absolutely <laughs> is. And the right way is my way. But at the same time, there's there's a way of looking at things through your own ignorance that always intrigues me. Whenever someone reads one of my pieces and comes up with an answer that is so fundamentally prejudiced, it, it really freaks me out because I'm like, please don't, Please don't associate me with that. Please don't. Please don't ruin my poem with that. You just you've made it all dirty now. Yeah, that is. It it, it must be difficult when because I find it interesting as well because you are in a sort of unique position of of having your work seen a lot, but kind of being quite in control of it. Right, you are writing your own stuff and then oh, yeah. producing that and releasing it. it is you know a, a kind of the totality of the project is your own, mm-hmm. and so then 
but then everyone has such but then a huge amount of people have access to it post that like to go from such all encompassing control to then such a lack of it is that something that's difficult to to deal with in the creative process like does it affect then what you're you're writing i try and have a little bit of a disconnect between the online stuff and what gets written because my stuff is very personal it's it's there's no there's no part of it that's not inherently tied to who i am and what i've been through so I have to almost create a character to perform the poems that is far removed from the person who writes it because I am an incredibly anxious, shy, little... I, I just... I've never done a, a public performance of my, my own poetry because the, the idea of that terrifies me. I'm, I'm so anxious. I, I enjoy the fact that I can create a highly stylized, highly rehearsed, highly controlled performance contained within one small segment that people can then look at because I I am in control of it. That's why people don't say, oh, Lynn, you're not going to write a book, you're not going to release your stuff because I've got a back catalogue that would fill, a, you know, a wee collection quite easily. Yeah. But I don't like the thought that it's not me saying it and it's not me that's in control of that narrative because it is such a, a deeply personal thing. But having said that, when I am... Um, some of my stuff's been used in schools and the responses that the Waynes gave me back was just, <laughs> it was incredible for me because first of all, I, I never thought that would happen. I, that's, that's, that was a, a personal goal, you know, it was I, at the start of the pandemic when I started releasing my stuff, I said if any teachers want to use it um, because there's kind of a dearth of, of Scots language content at the minute. I mean, we're getting some more long form stuff some novels and and some plays and stuff but the the poetry there's not been as much in recent years so i wanted to make sure that the you know if they wanted to to use scots in the classroom that they could for free um but when they actually took me up on the offer and the wains were writing essays on my stuff and and having discussions and you know i was i was zooming into classrooms and mm. some of the stuff that was coming back was stuff that i hadn't intended when i was writing it but the fact that it was resonating with the wains i was like oh this is blowing my mind so in some ways i don't mind if people uh, interpret my stuff without my control but at the same time i'm still a massive control freak <laughs> It's the double-edged sword, though. You know, I mean, like you could you could go further down that route, right? You could you could not um, do stuff as much for public release, but aim, you know, to to workshops and, and the sort of academic side of it and mm-hmm. stuff. But I, it's at that same time, then you wouldn't have the the sort of broad ranging impact that you have, right? There is something to be said of having someone, you know, high profile with with you know a lot of attention. Speaking Scots affects more people than you know doing individual workshops would right so it's that kind of trying to balance i guess the the expo you know exposing yourself and your sort of you know personal work to a, a maximum amount of people but then that has a positive impact in terms of exposure of scots like absolutely that's like I, I, I use my poetry as a wee bit of therapy it's cathartic for me and it's always something that i've been through that i want to write about and work through myself but when i put it in scots it's it's an interesting thing for me because when when you read Scott's poetry, more often than not, it's a comedic thing. It's a comedic stylistic choice yeah. and, and Scott's is funny. And I really wanted to make sure that my poetry, well, sometimes it's comedic and humorous. It's I don't want it to be a joke. I'm not using these words because I want people to laugh at them or find them funny or cute or a curiosity. I'm using these words because this reflects how I speak and how a great many people speak and have been prevented from speaking. Like, when people are in therapy and they're Scots speakers, I can't remember who did the study, but they don't use Scots, they use English to distance themselves from the difficult emotions. And I wanted to make sure that I remove that distance and I speak through my poetry the way I would speak to a pal. That's that's a really... that's really eye-opening that sort of idea of like i had never considered that that how difficult that must be to to be doing something like therapy in a you know language that isn't the most comfortable for you to use like that's so strange an idea uh yeah that's really difficult i think it's it, it's interesting as well the point you're saying about comedy because i think it's it's a, a classist thing it's because that was the only ways we were allowed to use scots you know what i mean like like so it becomes then 
what the association is. The association is with like a lack of education or with humor or with, with you know, being colloquial or that sort of twee, like traditional use of it rather than a kind of modern, you know, active thing. It's, I know we've had folk on, um, I had Robin McLeod, who is a Gaelic speaker mm-hmm. and like he does game streams. Because yeah. he's like, yeah, because young people who know Gaelic want a game still. <laughs> like it doesn't, you're not suddenly living in the 1800s because you absolutely. Still speak. Have you have you found that in your work? Because I I know you're like that that sort of thing of talking about mental health and and sort of that more confessional work ties in more with the kind of modern performance poetry scene, right? Where people are doing sort of confessional work and it's you know sort of rooted in either social justice or, or, or things like that whereas that isn't as present in the sort of Burnsian tradition where it's more kind of subject based is that merging Absolutely. of two something that like you, you know came about naturally or did you pivot to try and write those subjects I I grew up on Burns I, I competed in Burns competition since I was about eight till I was about 18 so I digested a lot of old Scots, I digested a lot of poetry, and I digested a lot of the sort of cultural attitudes towards it. I mean, if you look at where a young Scottish person's going to see the Scots language out with the home, you're going to see it in Barnes once a year, <laughs> you're going to see it on Hogmanay, Old Lang Syne, and you're going to see it on telly in things like Tuna Fat and Still Game and Rab C. Nesbitt. Yeah. But there's a disconnect between the sort of poetic, gorgeous, you know, Burnsian, this is Tia Moose, this is, this is the life, the universe condensed into one infinite moment where we respect this as, an, as a language and as a cultural icon. And then you've got something like Still Game or Tune the Fat where we laugh at it. It's funny. And obviously it's funny because it's a phenomenal writing, but for most people who aren't Scott speakers, they're laughing at the funny, you know, they're, they're laughing at the stereotype. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I watched Still Game, I thought, oh, that's my papa. That's, that's my mum. That's how they speak. These are the people that I resonate with. And sometimes I didn't know why it was funny. It's yeah. like in, have you seen that bit in Brave where the guy's speaking Doric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's hilarious. It's so but funny. But it's so strange that that's the butt of the joke. You know, watching I mean? that as a Scots speaker, you're sitting there thinking, "Why are you laughing? Yeah. Why? Why is it funny right now?" And, and when I started to write my poetry, and people would sometimes find it funny, and I'd be like, "Why are you laughing? I'm I'm in pain." Yeah. And and it it evolved from that where I just it really put a fire under me and I was like, no, do you know what? I'm going to make you uncomfortable for laughing. I'm going to make you feel things other than humour. I'm going to make you feel genuine sorrow through what you perceive as a comedic language. And turning that sort of comedy into tragedy is what I've sort of been doing. And a lot of of my work is about subversion, as you say. Like, the burn stuff is about you know, subject matter, whereas I, I take a more personal, confessional route to it. But there's other ways I'm subverting as well. I did a fairy tale series where I subverted them and I'm trying to do a sort of comedy tragedy thing where I take a, a funny way of writing and I make it really heartbreaking. And, and I, I just want to subvert sort of preconceived notions of Scottish identity, but also about the language, because that's what I'm here for, you know, to spread it, but also to make it normal, to normalise it. I mean, yeah, it's it's bang on. I think it is the best way to go about, um, you know, pr- preserving any sort of language is is to make it, you know, exist in the current, right? Like it's that's that's the you know the it's 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 rooted in folk to try and make mm-hmm. you think that. Like I I grew up hating my accent, so like my my family's all from Glasgow. Like my parents speak with very broad Glaswegian accents, and I sound like this because like I. <laughs> I was encouraged by my mum to not to speak properly right and so like from as early on as I could remember I associated Scottish accents with like not speaking properly because that's what I had been told and and it precipitated forward when I got into like 
theater it's very interesting that you know even in artistic scenes you know there's like preservation of gallic right because it's seen as this romantic language you know you can you can explore whereas scots was just seen as you not speaking right and there's like it's it you know i was told by directors and other actors and producers like for years that like oh you've got such a good accent and what by that they meant by that is oh you don't sound incredibly scottish and it like ingrains into you absolutely but you grew up speaking scots right like in in the house yeah i mean it was it was just something that you didn't really think. People are always like, oh, when did Scots become important to you? Scots has never been important to me. Scots has just been a thing. Yeah. Like, it was never, it was never massive. It was just, it was words and phrases and things that you'd slowly realise weren't in everyone's house and that's fine. But the accent thing is massive and it's, it comes across in my poetry and stuff because people comment all the time that I'm putting it on or... You know, <laughs> and I, yeah, it's it's amazing. I love it because I've got so many different accents. I've got my uni accent. I've got my interview accent. I've got my job accent. I've got my home accent. I've got my poem accent. It's like, and and then when I speak Scots and use language, it's interesting how that gets criticised and all because it's like, people have said to me, when using Scots, that I'm rough. I'm unfeminine. I'm. I'm not speaking properly, I sound unintelligent, uneducated, but also when people analyse my work, when, when the, the Waynes were analysing my work in the school, one of the, one of the things that I thought was fascinating was the fact that it was a poem about abuse and one of the Waynes had written that my use of the Scots language was done intentionally to mimic the harsh, abusive, rough nature of the person it was about. Oh, man. And I was like, I was like well, first of all, as I say, there's no wrong way to do it, so I'm I'm sure if that resonated with the person that yeah. they you know, but at the same time I sat back and I thought, My God, how can a statement from a victim sound abusive yeah. if it's written in Scots? Because you wouldn't say that about any other language. You wouldn't say, Oh, she's speaking Spanish? I don't know, man, that sounds really unfeminine. <laughs> That's so bizarre. But it made me think, what about it is unfeminine? Is it the directness? Is it the roughness? Is it the vowels, the consonants? What about my accent or the way that I express myself changes based on the language? Because it's I'm the same person, I look the same, I sound the same to some extent, but there's something about the way that I'm expressing myself that changes people's perceptions in, a com in an instant, in a heartbeat, in a poem even. It's very strange. I, 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 because it's fascinating. You say, you know, the the putting it on. Like everyone's voice changes. Like when I'm doing, like the way I'm talking to you now is different from how I went. And that was Hannah Lavery with the because I was doing something different then. You know what I mean? Like, or, or you know, when I speak to my my parent, my dad on the phone, like my voice leans back into you know a more like more his style, right? I use more uh, Scots, like because I'm speaking to him and if I was at my you know old customer service job I'd speak differently <laughs> that's crazy to think because I suppose as well like you know you should always aim yourself to an audience so I imagine if you're speaking to a you know hypothetically you were speaking to a very large audience right that you knew was made up of an international group like you would probably speak slower and more clearly than you would if you were speaking to you know your best pal like absolutely in the club right like it just doesn't make sense that that wouldn't connect to people that's so strange <laughs> i think it, it's a helpful tool to be able to be a bit of a chameleon in the way that you sound but it's also incredibly it's nippy it's it's weird because there's a certain element of depersonalization where you think to yourself which one am i which version yeah. of myself will i be and sometimes you don't choose it. When I'm angry, of course, I'm going to sound Scottish. <laughs> I'm going to sound absolutely raging. But when I'm wanting to be perceived as intelligent, I'm going to speak more anglicised. Yeah, it's, it's. I think it's that thing. It's like it's fine to to be more anglicised. Obviously, you know, if you're speaking to people like I don't speak Scots, right? So you're obviously speaking to me to make me able to understand yeah. right if you spoke very broad scots i'd just be nodding and smiling and this would be very strange so like that's that's just something anyone would do you know if you're the person who has the ability to like i live with a swedish person he mm -hmm. speaks english because i don't speak swedish like that's that's a that's you being considerate not you being duplicitous that's such a strange so people instinct. say it when i was i was on the radio once and someone said you spoke English the whole time. Like, are you putting the Scots on? And I was like, 
I speak <laughs> I speak English, I speak Scots, I also speak Spanish and French and if they had wanted to, I would have spoken in any one of those languages. But I'm not gonna sit and make a point of it to be, as you say, duplicitous or to be, you know, hard headed enough that I, I prioritise people's understanding over anything else and I prioritise people's comfort. So if I'm gonna speak to someone, I'm gonna do it in a way that they will be able to understand me. And if I'm doing a lesson on Scots yeah, the accent's thicker, I feel more comfortable, I'm going to use more Scots words. But if I'm just speaking to somebody who doesn't really have an interest in Scots or doesn't really speak it or doesn't really want to have a lesson taught to them, I'm just <laughs> going to use English because it's easier. <laughs> it's Some people will refuse to see the woods for the trees. <laughs> but like, I, I think you make a really good point on that as well. And it's clear in your... Uh, like, I, I followed you on Twitter before I realised you did poems because it was the Scots word of the day was the first thing <laughs> I'd sort of seen of you, right? And I was just like, oh, this is good. Like, this is a very easy, short and digestible way to understand a thing I should probably understand anyway. And so, like, because you're very clear and you're very precise and, like, you go over it again, but slower. And, you know what I mean? Like, there's a there's a format and a structure to, to each of those little videos that's, like, very easy to understand and very easy to go along with. And it's captioned and it's, like... And I think putting it out on social media is such a good idea because it's so easy for people to pick up and like follow along with. Has the response been obviously, you know, we were talking earlier about like some of the negative stuff. Has the response been positive? Have you have people been like learning Scots through that? Is that something that's that's working out? Two things make me happier than anything else. And it's <laughs> when people say, This reminds me of something that I've lost. Or when somebody says to me, this is something that I have gained. When it's someone who's maybe a new Scot, maybe didn't grow up with Scots, maybe has come to this country from another and wants to participate in something that they think is awesome. Or whether it's someone who had it and thought they'd lost it, but they've got it back. And I just think to myself, this is, if even one person, I know it's cliche, but if even one person's taken anything from what I've done, that feels like it's worthwhile. Because it's been a year now, it's been like, over 365 videos and every single one has been rewarding for me personally because you know for 365 days I've done some like <laughs> <laughs> which for someone who's exceptionally mentally ill is is such a it's such a weird thing to be able to do because I can't even say with absolute certainty that for 365 days I've eaten or yeah. slept yeah. well or lived a good you know healthy happy life or showered or been absolutely 100% tip top but I can say it with absolute certainty for 365 days there's been a Scots word of the day <laughs> <laughs> but I mean so you gotta you gotta celebrate those things that is I, I, I as well as someone who produces a lot of like online content I don't think people who don't ever understand like what you know people will think oh well it's just a video a day like that's that is not easy when you have it's other so stuff hard. going on or you're feeling shit or like you've run out of words you want to talk about or what you know what I mean like whatever it is just that it's not clicking that day or a million things come up I think it's very impressive <laughs> when you when you've got when you've got work when you've got uni in the same day so you think to yourself well I've not got time to do this when I get home because it'll be half past 12 at night so to get the word done I need to get up at six yeah, then 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 then, you, then they see the pain. <laughs> <laughs> then, and then some people are like, "Oh, this wasn't a very clean take. Oh, you weren't wearing makeup." I'm like, "Yeah, because I was late for work." <laughs> people will pick up on anything. That's it's amazing. That's so that's petty. what that's what this has taught me is that people are so past remarkable and they physically cannot see something that they do not like or resonate with and just let it let it be. Let yeah, it let it die. No, they them. they must tell you. They must come up to your door, knock on it, and say, "By the way, I think you're shit." <laughs> I, I, on the the thing you're saying of uh, you know people from from you know not native Scot speakers right people who maybe aren't from Scotland that are that are incorporating words. Katie Ailes is the researcher for this show and she is American and she absolutely loves Scots. Like she has a poem on our channel called Out With, which is because <laughs> she has she loves Out With. Um, it's just such a useful word and it doesn't exist outside of Scotland. And I didn't know that until she explained it to me. <laughs> she, so that's a purely Scottish word uh, and stuff. And I, I love that because she, she rolls in words like 
it's funny because we were talking about it. She's almost the opposite to me. I'll occasionally drop in like linking words like, oh, he's Fade Linlithgow, right? Like, mm-hmm. and, and whereas she uses very specific words like numpty and out with and, mm-hmm. you know, the specific things she's rolled into her vocabulary. Uh, and I think I'm, you're see, I'm seeing more of that. And I, I, can't, I can't, you know, say for sure it's linked to yourself, but people doing stuff online and being more engaging and more relevant and more kind of like, young and modern i think is definitely con- connecting in it's like you saw duolingo kicked off everyone speaking gaelic right yes i think you... it's i think it's amazing i think you're absolutely right i think we've got a wee bit of renaissance going on and which is it's nice <laughs> it's so surprising because i i've always been kind of you know how everyone's got something that they're really nerdy and passionate about and, and you think to you pat them on the head and you say, oh, that's great, you love Star Wars, that's great, you love trains, you think flags are cool, amazing, you do you, babe. And mine's always been Scots, which is so weird and niche and not cool. <laughs> but I'm trying to make it a wee bit more cool because the, the Scottish cringe is massive. And, you know, a lot of the hate I get is from Scots speakers. A lot of the hate I get is from people who use the language but don't want to admit they do because that makes them bad at grammar or bad at spelling. I think the fact that I can sort of contextualise it within the context of a language, you know, I know I know about linguistics, I've studied it, I know about different languages, I've studied them. So I can say, oh, this isn't just, you know, a bad word that you shouldn't say. This is a noun which came from this, it's derived from this, this is the etymology, and this is its usage, and this is how you conjugate it, you know? it's. And I'm sure that lands really well with them <laughs> when they're Oh, yeah, no, they, they hate that. They, they call me, I think I got called a linguistic witch once. I, wh- whatever that possibly means <laughs> it's 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 fascinating i think seeing that the sort of resurgence of of you know people trying to make you know scots language whether that's scots or doric or gallic or you know shitlandic any of these sort of like uh you know mixture of dialects and languages i guess like trying to bring them into the now because i i see that in the spoken word scene and i, I find it interesting what you're saying about like the having not really engaged with that you know you you i guess you've been busy doing a video every day and there's been a yeah. pandemic and like but is is that something you're looking to engage with the sort of performance poetry scene or that that kind of live because i find it so interesting that so much of your stuff is rooted in the oral right scott's language itself mm-hmm. is, a, is an oral language there's debate over spelling or whether you should even bother having a dictionary or whatever because it's it's about the sounds of the words rather yeah. than the spellings of the words and and i think that's something that's so core to performance poetry is like i really regret doing a self-published collection early on when i started writing because really? i wish those poems weren't out there now and if i do those poems now they're not the way they were written in that book that's for sure and it's like i I, I see I want to be able to constantly change my stuff and let it go when I don't want to do it anymore and you can't if you've put it out there and I think a lot of spoken word artists feel the same that there's a, a want to only exist in the live so it seems like such a perfect fit for you to come into mm-hmm. I, I completely agree I recently went through and added new endings onto a lot of my poems because they were written a year ago and as a year had passed I've done a lot of reflection a lot of you know, try to work on myself and a lot of therapy. And I I had new perspectives on things. I had things I, I didn't think I'd be able to say and I wanted to. I had things I wanted to, you know, I had a message I wanted to convey. So as you say, when I went back and looked at the endings of these poems, I was like, this is not how I want my story to end. I want to rewrite the ending. And the great thing about mine is I can just, I can just do that because it doesn't exist. Like, it's a very ephemeral temporal thing where i don't have to commit to anything so i don't have to write things down a lot of my stuff which freaks people out a lot of my stuff isn't even written down i've got no idea i've got no idea what some of my poems are about i forget i've done stuff i'll come back and it'll be like oh that was actually quite class well done <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's, it's it's as you say this sort of once it's out there you can't take it back and there's there's a, a downside to that but there's also a really positive side to that which is the fact that you said it and now you can critique it and come back with a new perspective and you can respond to your own work and reply to your own work and redo your own work and have different versions of it and you can then track your growth and progress 
Yeah, I, I, 100%. I think as well, like, poems are affected by the reading. Like, I can read some of my poems and make people laugh and then read that same poem a different way and make it seem like it's got an entirely different meaning. Like, depending on what I'm trying to achieve in that particular set. Absolutely. And that's what I like about being on a stage in a space is, like, it's a conversation with the audience. I'm feeling out what mood they're in, right? If they're upbeat, rowdy crowd, I'm going to try and make everything I'm saying sound funnier and sound yes. more upbeat. Like, I can play with that. And I think you don't get that because you can't control the tempo of how someone else's brain reads. And I find that really, like, yeah, I... I it just it just seems like I, I'm so surprised that you haven't done lots of gigs. But then, how long have you been, you know, putting poems out there online? I have been putting my stuff out there. The first one was I'm not having children, and that was about a year ago. That was last August. So, so there sorry, have been last no October. Gigs. So last that October. makes sense. <laughs> so there's there's been nothing to do. It's not that I'm lazy. It's just there's been nothing to do. <laughs> but uh, but I'm I'm so anxious. If you put me in front of an audience, I'd be shaking. When I used to perform Burns poetry, I used to walk about the stage as I performed, and it, I would always be at the end because my last name's Penny. So I'd be down the bottom of the the you know the roster because it'd be alphabetical and everyone would sit there and think oh, what a great style she's not static she's living the <laughs> no my wee knees were shaking and i didn't really want the judges to see it <laughs> it's funny because you seem so confident in in your videos you know what i mean you're very like uh, you know, that presentation it feels very polished it feels like someone who's who's very on top of like ah, oh, i'm talking to these people i'm getting that out is that just the disconnect of like not seeing the people literally there yeah it is and it's also the fact that you you see that you see the final version you don't see the version <laughs> where i'm swearing at myself and i'm i'm getting all raging and i'm great I've had, I've had takes where i've had to cut because i burst into tears and and it's like you then you then fix your makeup you take a deep breath and it's back in you're just all right lads and and people see that version and i think yeah. that's an important message to to convey is the fact that when people say to me, oh, you don't look mentally ill, oh, you don't look like you struggle with this. I do, I do, but I've put a lot of effort into making sure that you don't see that. <laughs> because with the best one in the world, there's a stigma attached to it, and there's a... Nobody wants to watch someone bursting into tears. They want to watch someone smile and happy, engaging and positive. And I'm not there in the word of the day for it to be about me. It's about the word. So I am just a vessel for which the word can flow through and if that means that I have to paint on a smile and and get through it then I will because it's not about me that's yeah it's a it's a fascinating way to kind of like separate it out I would imagine that is helpful in a lot of regards to have a bit of uh, emotional distance from it when it's something so high profile yeah because then when people come on and criticize me it's not me they're criticizing it's the character that I stepped into that day you know yeah, that makes sense. That it's it's how very much how I treated uh, spoken word when I first came to it because I come from like a sort of theatre background, mm -hmm. so I'm very like used to and comfortable performing. But I was very very uncomfortable as soon as I was talking about my real self and trying to be my real self on stage. So it was much easier to think of it as I am playing a poet, <laughs> and, exactly. and I just so happen to have written the poem like. That's it. That's the when people are like, oh, you know, you're you're so popular now. You've got so many followers. I don't have... Le no. Len Penny has followers. I personally have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> don't, I do not wish to be perceived. That's how people come up to me. It's happened a couple of times at work. I work in, in a restaurant and people come up to me and they'll be like, are you... Are, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm absolutely not. <laughs> no. I look like her. I sound like her. I am not her. Go away. <laughs> But it's fascinating because I think we didn't, you know, we didn't used to have that. It tended to be, you know, the celebrity, right? Be, be, rec being recognisable used to be something preserved for people who are, you know, big movie stars, big pop stars, whatever. And by the time they had reached that level, right, they're they're in the bubble, right? Because they yes. just they're getting to that level came with a certain level of finance, right? That meant you didn't exist in yes, the normal and, world and you have media training and you have someone to counsel you through it you yeah, don't just have teams and a PR poem go people. viral and now suddenly people are filling your inbox with rape threats it's like, yeah. I, like I, I, I feel like I've skipped a step and I just want to go back and, and that's why there's a sort of a disconnect between it because I have had to create my own 
barrier between me and what's happening online because it freaks me out no end I, absolutely i mean i guess the only sort of positive side to it obviously not positive to the the shit you deal with but in terms of like that difference is that those people previously right by the time you achieved a platform that was worth anything you know a soapbox to speak from you were distant enough from the people you could actually help with that soapbox yeah. whereas someone like yourself who has that big presence yet that absolutely comes with shit but it also comes with like you know what it's like to be a student you know what it's like to work a low paying job and stuff and so like you can see that in your output right being honest and open about mental health and being honest and open about like the, the things you care about right like that is that is also a huge benefit that especially for like I said you know a, a sort of young woman wouldn't be something you would ever get until you were so far removed like is that something that you're like aware of does that help get through the nonsense it does it also helps when I see young girls and young women looking to what I'm doing and I know for a fact if I had any kind of agent any kind of you know person trying to control in my image or my optics or anything like that they would not let me have a phone because I will be on at three in the morning to fight with your dad on Twitter I will I have the time I have I have I have the time and requisite mental illness to fight with your dad on Twitter and I will because I can't let it go and I'm sick of letting it go. You know, people, when you get catcalled, you're supposed to just put your head down, keep walking. Put your head down, keep walking. When someone, you know, is, is touching you inappropriately, put your head down, keep walking. Get out of the situation. No, I'm a turn around. And, and yes, it's because I'm on Twitter. Obviously, if it happened in real life, I'd be greeting and, and a mess. But because it's on Twitter, I have the space and the audience to to come back with something that's got a wee bit of, you know, a wee bit of venom and a wee bit of, like, it might make them think again a little. It's like, I, I try and think of myself as, like, a... This is going to sound hideously cliche, but, like, a thistle, you know? No. People think a thistle is nice and beautiful, and then you try and pick it, and you're going to get absolutely jagged. To, like, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> That is that is a good way to be. I like that. That's uh, and very Scottish. It's good. Oh yes, nice. absolutely. I could have gone. I could have gone with the rose there, but I thought that would be a bit <sighs> always thistle. That's, that's decision made. Amazing, <laughs> Len. I could I could chat to you all day uh, about this stuff. I find it fascinating, and like uh, I genuinely hope that the nonsense it, it doesn't doesn't you know have too much of an impact. Because like from the other end, I know there is a, a bunch of people who are really appreciating what you're putting out there and i hope we can get you down on a loud poet stage at some point i'll try and we'll try and get you worked up to it and make sure we've got a nice audience and stuff like that it'll be good <laughs> uh, but yeah uh, would you mind rounding off the show for us with a wee poem absolutely amazing um i'm trying to think of, of what, which one to pick now um so I'll, I'll do the one that that the wayne's um the Wayne's analyzed in their class because I, I want I want to know I want to know what you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So this one is called Civil War. At ease, soldier. There's peace now at last. She's just a mistake you can leave in your past. She's just an error in your flawless code. She's just a bomb. She was built to explode. At ease, soldier. Let's leave this war civil. Ken, I'm no good with details, but you felt like the devil. And my heeds infiltrate it with enemy spies. I should mind now the Oz fair and love war and lies. At ease, soldier. It was all in good fun. Atween your arms or bullets, just give me the gun. One mere day with you or a lifetime in hell. Give me the gun and I'll do it myself. At ease, soldier. It's been over a year. And all she minds of you is the bruises and fear. All she minds of your regime a fear and control is. She called for a truce, afore she called the polis. At ease, soldier. The war's long since deed, and piece by piece, peace is what's left in her heed. And the shrapnel's still there, but it's no quite as deep. And she still kens your name, but at least she can sleep. Dear she, what was her, and new fecht to be me. This war won't be won till the day that you dee. Dear she, what well, was me? In new fix wars I knew. Aye, he did win the war, but he'll never win you. 
Wow. Amazing. Amazing. I'd see, I, I think there's, is, is that the one the kid uh, said was like, he thought it was aggressive. Yeah. Like, cause I guess there is that thing of like, at, at points, Scots can sound quite sharp, right? Yes. But I think it doesn't make, it doesn't make the, cause for me, that's coming from your perspective, right? Like the, the, the voice of the reader is, is, is a feminine voice in my yeah. head like but the the act they're talking about is violent and sharp mm-hmm. and so the words reflect that it's like very staccato right it's very pointy and and, and sharp at the start but there's that bit right uh the sort of like it's the last third as you go into where it softens and it's yeah. almost the most um scots right like it's less it's very unanglicized there's sort of words there and they're very soft it's those soft f's and stuff that are like that's where you see through past the point of the initial like violence and that's reflective and soft and like I don't know I so I don't see it like that I see it as yeah someone describing something violent but not yeah that's that's, that's really what I wanted I wanted a sort of juxtaposition between a sort of the, the way that I looked at it was you've got the the war and you've got the 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 soldier and you've got the violence but then you've got a sort of letter from you know how like the dear john letters and like the the sort of you know writing from home when you're at war and you've got this sort of you know poetic love aspect to it but but instead of it being from a partner to a partner it was from the self to the self it's it's a really beautiful piece and i I think it's interesting as well because like you were saying the the idea that rhyme right or or consistent sort of rhyme structures are because they're sing-songy and so that can often associate to like to people thinking it's it's you know fits with almost like you know children's rhymes or whatever you know there's that kind of sing-song nature to it but for me that felt very modern like it, you know it's it's it, the cadence can bend like the way it's written in meter doesn't necessarily mean you have to read it exactly like that yeah. and you do bend some of the lines and stuff that it makes it you know that where you're putting your emphasis and your focus does make it feel more fluid than a rigid kind of meter would and i think it makes sense to what you're saying then of like you don't necessarily want them written down because when they're written down then the meter can't bend it's it's, stuck, it's like when right? you see the score of a piece and the 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 person who's playing it is using rubato and they're stealing from bars and giving to yeah. bars and and they're you know it's not, it's, it's like when you're there's a jazz piece and it's just jazz like a saxophone solo for 24 bars yeah. and it's like you know you you could you could write that down but you're gonna it's not gonna be the same and you know the way that i the way that i write is very much like every performance is going to be different and that's why when i see it written down it doesn't feel like real to me until i say it that's yeah i think that that is the way i to look at it like yeah it's not it's not properly out there it's the it's the script you're reading from right the script isn't the movie the movie is made up exactly. once it's spoken like yeah very interesting i like like i said i could bug you forever and we are going to chat for a bit longer over on the loudcast extra guys so if you want to see that you can jump over to the i am loud patreon channel uh, and sign up for as little as a dollar a month i think it's or pounds now i don't really know uh, but do go and check out the patreon and check out the loudcast extra we're gonna hear another poem from len and we're gonna chat about it and there's a whole bunch of other stuff on there you can you can check out uh, otherwise guys if you could give us a little like on this video it would be massively appreciated if you could hit that subscribe button i will weep with joy uh, it's, it means a lot to us it helps us get the videos out there for folks to see uh, we greatly appreciate it but that is all from us this week a uh, brilliant conversation conversation some wonderful poems it's been a good one guys and we will see you next time len say goodbye goodbye thank you for having me thank you so much for watching this video if you enjoyed it we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button if you could hit the subscribe button and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.